He's got men in mind when he's speaking, this warrior man. And I love talking to guys like that. So if you're here, come with me as we walk in this passage. Philippians 3, starting in verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. When I was in Navy boot camp, they taught us how to march in formation, which I still kind of don't get. Because in the Navy, after you get out of the Navy, you don't march in formation anywhere ever again. No matter what season of life it is, or like, you just don't. You go to a ship or somewhere else. But they taught us to march. And so they tell us to fall in. 80 guys would fall into this, this, these ranks. And it was a mess at first. And they tried to teach us how to, to, to march in formation. And usually someone was coming on out be, be, before, uh, beside us. And it was a train wreck at first. Because you're just staring at the back of the, the, the guy's head in front of you. And everyone's trying to march at the same point. And if it falls apart, like the whole thing falls apart. Because you've got these GI issue combat boots. And if someone messes up, you're just like shredding the heel of the guy in front of you. And as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about the guy that stood next to me for all those weeks. I can't remember his last name. I know it started with a T, and I know we were about the same height because that's how we got next to each other. But he was from Missouri, like Missouri, Missouri. And every time the guy in front of us would mess this up, he would just berate them in this Missouri accent. And he would say things to them that you cannot say in church. And the way he said it and the accent with which you said it, like it would cause all of the rest of us to fall out and we just fall apart laughing hysterically. And I hadn't thought about him for 20 years, but I thought about him today. Because you're following this person in front of you, you're just staring at the back of their head and that's, you're all going the same direction and, and they, it's important that we all stay in step. And then we had this crazy drill instructor that was always watching us, angry watching. And one day we were marching in, in, in formation and we're outside, I'll never forget it, because uh, the guy who led us was this 19-year-old kid that they called the RPOC, Recruit Petty Officer in Charge. We love our acronyms in the military. So he was the RPOC. He was responsible for all 80-some of us. God bless him. And there was a day when we were marching, and our angry drill instructor, he goes, RPOC, before I rip your blank, 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 head off. Where is your cutlass? The Arpok carried a sword, which once again, no idea. Swashbuckling days are gone for centuries, right? But he carried a sword and he'd forgotten his. In the military, as in life, if you're going to succeed and lead, attention to detail is important, isn't it? And these guys just had a few short weeks to take all of us from all these different places and family of origin and values and get us aligned and marching in the same step so that they could turn us loose on the fleet and everything would go relatively well. And so when we got back to our barracks, there was this, this, this it's called the 1MC, this, this speaker system that goes out to the whole building, RPOC, report to the petty officer's lounge where all the drill instructors hung out. And this kid, 19 years old. And then comes back like an hour and a half later, literally limping, just disheveled, shirt pulled out, hat on sideways, sweating, crying. They just beat this kid up for an hour and a half. And just, it was horrible. <laughs> I bet you he probably still carries a sword. He's probably not in the military anymore. Because <laughs> they were training him and they were training us in order to be effective in the fleet. And when God starts getting us together, when we start following Christ, we realize we become citizens of heaven and we need to live that out. One of the first things he says is fall in line. Find a group or an individual of people who are following me and just get behind them and stare at the back of their head until you figure it out. And... and there's suffering out there. Following Jesus is hard. And so if we're not prepared for that, when it comes, it'll totally tear us apart. 
In a different uh, a book of the Bible, 2 Timothy, the same author on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says to, the, uh, to Timothy specifically, this leader that he developed, he said, share in suffering with me as a good soldier of the cross. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. And if you're here and you've placed your faith in Christ, he wants, us, he wants you to find people who are following him. And he wants you to sync up with them and imitate them as they imitate Jesus. And even on the days when you can't see Jesus, just find someone who can and then look at the back of their head until you get through that season. And you might learn some hard lessons along the way. Might end up with a limp. But it's so that God can prepare you for what's coming. Because there's evil out there. And there are other voices and there are other directions and people are constantly trying to get the followers of Christ to pay attention to those. The next verse says this. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their gl they glory in their shame and their minds are set on earthly things. That word destruction, sometimes translated perdition, is the opposite of salvation. It's the destination that is eternal separation from God and from all of those who have been recorded in heaven in a place called hell. And there are people out there who are headed in that direction, who are marching to those orders and they're trying to get you and me, whoever we, they can, to follow them towards that. And the Bible says that their God is their belly. Their material desires are on the wrong things. They glory in their shame. They're proud of all the wrong things. And their minds are set on earthly things. They think about all the wrong things. And they're headed to destruction. So don't follow them. Or God forbid you could end up in the same place. And Paul was a tough guy. The apostle Paul was a tough guy. History records some of the things he experienced. He was given 40 lashes minus one twice, which means for preaching Christ and believing in Jesus, he was given 39 lashes twice. He was imprisoned multiple times. He was shipwrecked. Just imagine like the ship capsized. It's like a, a movie, and they're all grabbing onto planks and things just to make it to shore. He, it says he was stoned for, for preaching Christ. They threw rocks at him until looking at him, they thought he was dead. And they drug him out of the city, thinking he was a corpse. That's how mutilated he was. And they left him outside the city, and it said he got up and went back in. The reason I share that, that in all of those historical accounts, I don't remember one instance where it talks about him experiencing any type of self-pity, any type of mourning, any type of fear. Uh, contrary, he says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. You know what makes him cry? Cause this tough guy to weep? Thinking about these people whose end is destruction. And these were enemies of the cross of Christ, which means they were enemies of Paul. And because he understood how all this ends, thinking about that, no matter what they'd done, was so sorrowful to him that he mourned. And if you're a citizen of heaven, a citizen soldier of the cross, and you're trying to figure out, how do I know when this is actually taking hold? Well, here's one sign even maybe especially the people you know hate you because of your life. But you know that they don't know Jesus. And you know because the word says it, how this ends. And that if something doesn't change, that is their end. And even though they hate you, you weep with compassion for them. You might be on the right track. But Paul says, for those of us here whose citizenship in heaven, he says, that's not us. Verse 20, 
Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Do you believe that? Because Jesus says that's happening. For those of us who have placed our faith in him, who have been rescued by him, transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's son, Jesus Christ, not only have we received salvation, Jesus is coming back. And when he does, he will transform. The, okay, I'm just going to be honest with you. Every year after 40, these are the ones I start focusing on. I didn't care about what I'm about to say before I was 40, but this is what I'm like, oh yeah. He's going to transform our broken, lowly bodies. And he's going to give us new ones, physical and powerful resurrection power, the same way, the same type of body he had when he was raised from the dead, which we'll have with him forever. Amen. And I think about this audience he's writing to, these, these veteran soldiers, right? These people that had served on the front lines of the army for all these years and the physical drain of that, all the armor that they had to carry, maybe the battles that they fought, and they did it faithfully, but things are probably broken now. And he says, the one who is, and, and the subject of all things, all means all, every little piece of life and eternity in this earth, all things have been subject to him. And he will transform your bodies into something new and powerful and eternal. And he says, Are those of us whose citizenship is in heaven, that's the second time he uses the words, that only, only twice in the entire Bible, Philippians 1.27 and here. Our politic, our citizenship is in heaven. So you can tell people, when you, what did you do at church this morning? We talked about politics. Our citizenship is in heaven. The expression of our citizenship, our politics are supposed to reflect and bring honor and be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those of us who hope like that are waiting for our Savior to come back for us. That word waiting, some, some of your versions say eagerly waiting. It, it's this like tiptoe anticipation. I travel a lot. I, I, my job is to go around the country helping churches get better. It's the best job ever. And I'm gone about 50% of the time. And when I get home, our little girl, who's seven, who's a first grader, she goes to this great school that we have to bus her to. And she's the first person that gets picked up in the morning. She's the last person that gets picked up in the afternoon. And those days when I get back from traveling, I'm sit and, and I get there before she gets back from school, 422. Not that I'm counting. I open the garage door, I drop the bed of my truck, and I just sit on the back of it, just swinging my arms and tapping my leg and just waiting for that bus to pull up. And then when it does, there's this little seven-year-old girl like this, (laughs) staring out the window because daddy's home. And she gets off the bus and she runs up to me and she gives me this huge hug. And then usually five seconds later, she wants something. (laughs) That's just, that's my reality, that's my world. Like, I'm so glad to see you. I want this, this, and this, and did you bring me anything? But I can't wait to see her. She can't wait to see me. And it says those of us whose citizenship is in heaven live our lives on tiptoe anticipation and expectation for the return of our Savior. So I ask you this, if you're here or you're watching and you're a Christian, are you in this season more anticipatory on your tiptoes of the results of of an election or the return of the king? And if it's not the latter, it's time to get back. Because this is what our, our politics say we hope for more than anything. So let's get back to that and find our joy. And the last verse, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in this, in the Lord, my beloved. Quick aside here, just to the men watching this. Paul's a man's man. He's a tough guy. 
And he's writing to these other tough guys. Roman soldiers. They didn't get any tougher than that. Veterans. And when he thinks about them and he writes to them, he says, I love you. I miss you. And you're beloved to me. And guys, I'm telling you that if you have people in your life that look to you for things, no matter how we were raised or what our personality is, those people need to hear that we love them. That we're not afraid to say when we're gone, I miss you. I miss you. And you're beloved to me. Because we've got sometimes little people in our lives, right? Real men aren't afraid to talk about stuff like that. Whose citizenship is in heaven because we've been trained because God talks about like like that about us and it transforms us at the end of boot camp there was a graduation there's this huge hall like a gym on steroids where they'd march I don't know how many divisions in finally figured out how to do it in step all of us hundreds and there were thousands of people in the bleachers watching us come in including my parents and they formed us all up in divisions standing straight and they went down and started to celebrate these different divisions at graduation until they got to ours. Division 472. Because we had an extra flag flying in front of our division. It was called the CNO flag, the Chief of Naval Operations flag. It was the highest honor that a recruit division could achieve throughout their entire time at boot camp. Logistically, educationally, physically, the entire 80-some people had to uh, achieve a standard of like an average score of like 95 or 97 percent across the entire division for the whole boot camp. And we did it. And as we're standing there, my parents and others are watching, when the, the MC, whoever was, a big Navy guy, I don't remember all those years ago, got to us, he stopped. He said, let me tell you about Division 472, winners of the CNO Award. The highest achievement you can do. And as straight as we were standing in that season, in that moment, we all stood a little straighter. Because, yeah, people have gotten pizza. (laughs) That sounds really good right now. It's it's lunchtime. And they gotten phone calls. And we didn't get those things. We just worked hard. But when graduation came, everybody else graduated. We graduated with honors. And the degree to which those of us who claim Christ are focused on the just filling our bellies, the wrong pursuits, the wrong thoughts, we're just engaged in civilian affairs. And if you place your faith in Christ, you will graduate. He's promised you that. Your name's written. But don't you want to graduate with honors? Paul says, you, to these guys, you are my joy and my crown. Because that's what this is about. Helping people follow Jesus. It's written right out there. Go, help people follow Jesus. That's what we talk about. We end every message. We become the church gathered now. Go, help people follow Jesus. And Paul says, that's how I'm going to be honored. When all the people are gathered together who have names are written in the book of life, The king has come back. He's setting up his eternal kingdom. We're all gathered. There's going to be so many people that march into that place using figurative language who when they tell their story will say, that guy, that guy impacted me. I didn't know what I was doing. He said, it's okay. I'm not perfect. I haven't arrived there yet. But what what I want you to do is this. Just get behind me and watch the back of my head for a while. We'll go together until you can see Jesus by yourself. And then you help someone else do the same thing. And that's the politics of citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And this world's trying to distract us from that. And it's working sometimes, but it's time to get back, church. Anything we're doing that is is minimizing our ability to help people say, hey, I see you, just get in, I know, it's confusing, just get in line behind me. We're all going together, let's go is something that should be eradicated from our lives. Because at the same time, it's just going to steal our joy because this is the best life possible anyway. And Jesus wants that for us. Amen? Let me pray for you. 
God, thank you that you came and rescued us, those of us who placed our faith in you, recorded our names in the book of life where we will, we will be in that place with you, with new bodies together forever. So Lord, help us to focus our efforts and our attention to just look at you. And if we can't see you, then let's just find someone who can and follow them. All the while inviting everyone who wants to just fall in the ranks and march towards Jesus and your mission forever. Lord, help us to remove the distractions. Help us to lift our eyes from material pursuits and boastful pride and stinking thinking. It's just out there. Help us to fix our eyes on you and you alone, the author and finisher of our faith. Until such time as we we stand here on tiptoes awaiting you, you come back from heaven to set all this right. So Lord, would you be with us now? Be with your church, all of us, men, women, boys, and girls, as we go out to help people follow Jesus. And it's in his name, in Christ's name we pray. The church said, amen.